There are men and women of extraordinary wisdom and insight who transcend the particular communities to which they belong, even while remaining firmly rooted in those communities. Such men and women are able to become teachers of mankind. Plato was one. Gandhi was one. St. Augustine was one. Mother Teresa was one. And Johann Christoph Arnold was one. His wisdom was the fruit of a life lived in a community dedicated to Christ-like simplicity, love, and holiness. Those are the virtues that he radiated for all of us, and those are the virtues that he modeled, not just for the members of the Bruderhof communities, but for all who had the great good fortune to come into contact with him. When I was with Christoph in his lifetime, I never left without experiencing what it must have been like to know one of the apostles of Jesus, to know someone who had walked with Jesus, who had talked with Jesus, who had eaten with Jesus, who had confided in Jesus. That's because Christoph was, of all the people I've known in my life, the one I most think of as a friend of Jesus, a personal friend of Jesus. And Christoph lived his life as a servant of God. Well, we're going to hear from others of Christoph's uh, friends, but we're going to uh, begin with a video tribute from the Cardinal Archbishop of this city, uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who cannot be with us this evening, but he has a few remarks that he shared by video, and then he'll give us a prayer uh, to open. So, uh, Heinrich, are we ready to go? Thanks, Professor George, and good evening, everybody. I sure wish I could be with you there in person to help pay tribute to the memory of my good friend, Pastor Johann Christoph Arnold. I'm in Washington these days for the meeting of the Pro-Life Committee of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, a cause that I know the pastor would support. See, I always look forward to being with the Bruderhof. Uh, I got to admit, that's because I always leave with a growler or two of freshly brewed beer, some of the freshest vegetables and the best homemade bratwurst I've ever tasted. But there's more to it than that, everybody. See, we all... Don't we? We all need the support and good example of individuals who can inspire us. We don't have a, a culture anymore that's going to lift us up. Our primary role model, of course, is Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We Catholics often look to the saints, especially the mother of Jesus, for inspiration. But thanks be to God, there are others right here and now that we can look to for guidance and how to the more faithfully live out the gospel of Jesus. I was inspired, something tells me all of you were, and I continue to be inspired by the man we're recalling with reverence and gratitude this evening, Pastor Johann Christoph Arnold, whom I came to know, respect, uh, admire, and love pretty soon after my arrival as Archbishop of New York uh, back in 2009. I can't take credit for the friendship and relationship we here in the Archdiocese have been fortunate to enjoy a deep bond with such a remarkable community, the Bruderhof. You know what they remind me of, everybody? Go to the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. In the Acts of the Apostles, written by St. Luke, we read account after account of how the early church, the apostles, inspired by the Holy Spirit, carried out that final mandate of Jesus. Go make disciples of all the nations. Now, they did that by their preaching and by many wonders and signs that God worked through him, but... It was also how they lived that helped bring more and more people to believe in Jesus and to be saved. Remember what Tertullian, the ancient theologian, said about that early Christian community? See, see how they love one another. We call that, you've heard the phrase, radical discipleship. Uh, that, and that radical discipleship, everybody, in the spirit of those very first days of the church in Jerusalem, of the Acts of the Apostles, continues on at the Bruderhof. Uh, so it's just not history, it's now. From my eight years of friendship with Pastor Arnold, 
his wonderful wife, Verena. I hope you're there this evening, Verena. And the hundreds of members centered at Woodcrest and up in Rifton. I can tell you, they are a light to the world and salt to the earth. I love them, and I've learned a lot from them. And my predecessors, especially Cardinal O'Connor and Cardinal Egan, claimed the, the same. You know, what, you know what the late lamented Father Benedict Rochelle once whispered to me? They're better Catholics than I am. <laughs> Pastor Arnold was especially courageous in his rock-solid conviction that God's Word, as revealed in the Bible, was true and reliable. That the incarnate Word, Jesus, was the way, the truth, and the life. He was so eloquent in sensing God's presence, even in adversity and setback especially in the recent loss of his daughter to cancer, the fragile health of his dear Verena, and his own suffering from cancer that led to his death this past Holy Saturday. His fortitude was vividly evident, wasn't it, in his ability to forgive. His defense of the life of the baby in the womb, his efforts to protect religious liberty from the intrusion of government and a hostile secular society, that took courage, folks. We labored shoulder to shoulder on these pivotal issues, and Pastor Arnold exuded uh, uh, an unfailing warmth and wisdom, and he inspired a trust. I miss him a lot. I'm never going to forget him. Now, good news, the charism of the Bruderhof comes not from one man, but from the Holy Spirit, not just from someone as towering as Johann Christoph Arnold. He admitted as much on Palm Sunday, six days before he passed away. I better read it so I get this quote right. The main thing is that God's kingdom advances. And if any one of us have had the chance to play just a little part in it, it's not because we're great or mighty, but because God is merciful and he's granting us the possibility to show love. God is the creator of everything. All he wants in return is that we love and worship him and most of all thank him. As you begin this evening's tribute, folks, might I ask that we take a moment to express our love and thanks to Almighty God for the gift of Pastor Johann Christoph Arnold. I know that if he were here with us in person tonight, he is with us in spirit, he would insist that we first take a moment to pause and remember all those who lost their lives in the attacks that took place 16 years ago today. So shall we pray? We're confident you're here with us, dear Jesus, because you gave us your holy word, quoted so often by, by Christoph, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there with them. We do gather in your holy name. We thank you for the gift of faith in you. We thank you for your presence in so many people, places, and things. We thank you for your, your gracious, unfailing help in times of, of adversity. And we praise you particularly from your presence that we detected in Pastor Arnold and the Bruderhof community. Would you keep him strong in his spirit and yours? Would you give consolation to Verena and the family? Would you give them now that same spirit of charity combined with fortitude to stand up for the gospel and to preach the truth in love? Remember too, all those who died that 9-11 and the families that still grieve them. As we make this prayer, as always, through Christ our Lord, amen. Thank you, everybody. Good night. God bless. Well, thank you, Cardinal. Uh, I want to uh, uh, say that we'll have uh, some Q&A after the speakers uh, have finished, but instead of just having questions uh, directly from the audience, uh, we're going to have you uh, write your questions out. There are little cards there at your seats, and anyone who has a question, uh, write it out, and someone will come and collect the uh, cards, and uh, then I'll ask as many of them as I can uh, at the end. Our uh, first speaker uh, is a hero. Dr. John Perkins was born into Mississippi poverty, the son of a sharecropper. He fled to California when he was 17 years old after his older brother was murdered by a town marshal. He vowed never to return, but in 1960, after he accepted Jesus Christ, 
he returned to his boyhood home to share the gospel with those who were still living there. His outspoken support and leadership role in the civil rights movement and demonstrations resulted in abuse, harassment, beatings, and even imprisonment. But he had stood strong for basic Christian values and for the rights of all. He's the author of many books. Uh, he has been a distinguished visiting professor at Seattle Pacific uh, University. Uh, he returned then to uh, uh, Seattle uh, Pacific uh, to launch the campus-based John Perkins Center for Reconciliation, Leadership, Training, and Community Development, a first-of-its-kind partnership which uh, Dr. Perkins has described as a lifelong uh, dream. And I know uh, how delighted uh, Christoph would be that the first speaker in this evening of tribute to him is another great hero, Dr. John Perkins. Well, this is like one of the greatest honors that I could have uh, to speak in terms of the legacy and the life of Christoph uh, in meeting him. I met him in the early 80s uh, after I had gone back to Mississippi during the, in 1960 and living my life there. I was looking for, after I found Christ in 1957, looking for an expression, a better expression of justice and love and community that reflected the New Testament. I'm still looking for a better expression of justice and reconciliation and development. But I met Christoph at the time that he was, had become the head of the leader within the Brutal Hall movement. And he was looking for the same expression of a better way of life and affirm the justice of God. And it was difficult to find. It was difficult to find in a society that had affirmed uh, the greatest statement in terms of their own founding ideas. Uh, the great declaration of independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all human beings was created equal and was endowed by their creator with certain rights. Chief among those were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Jesus said, I have come that they might have life, and they may have it more abundantly, that accommodated slavery and segregation, and was still doing it, based on both color and based on so-called race, which is to me a terrible mistake. It's not a good place to start because it seemed like it's a big lie when we talk about racial reconciliation the way we do because we have demonized the black race and it makes it very difficult and the very principles we use uh, over demonize it because it makes it just black and white. And he was like me looking for a better expression of that. Of that. Uh, we still have black churches, white churches, and theirs was a German church and a white church, and we was trapped many times by our own culture. And he was like me seeking it. I found in the Bruderhof community and under his leadership another seeker for justice and righteousness and a better expression. And that's how we came together. We came together to talk about that. How could he break out of that culture? Even the German culture, even the religious culture, sufficient enough to see really authentic reconciliation take place within our society. And so I've enjoyed this journey together with the Bruderhof. And I think we will be seeking for that city the rest of our life. 
And I think we should be joining together more to seek for that city that has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. And so I'm so thankful to have met him and joined with him in that struggle. And I think we're at ground zero again. And all of us need to be seeking at this time, particularly in the Protestant church, and I think in all the congregations, for a better and a more perfect expression. That was even the thought of the decoration that we'd be looking for and trying to find a better expression of human dignity and justice within society. So I would, boy, I see him as a giant and what he was able to do in coming to this country and what the Bruderhof has gone to now. And I'm just praying that God would raise up others to continue this growth, continue this seeking, and looking for ways to express the justice of God. And, and there are many places that they succeed. I think in their living, sharing their resources in some kind of equality, in a way that they could use more of those resources to tell others and to show others how to live. So this is really, like to me, a, a, a wonderful opportunity to be here tonight and to talk about a, a life a meaning and struggle in life. So thank you. Thank you, people who are going to take up this challenge to move this, keep moving, keep seeking for a greater expression of human freedom and justice in our society. I love the Bruderhof community. I love Christoph. I love all of those workers with it. And so I'm highly honored to be here. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Perkins, for those uh, beautiful words. Uh, your friendship with Christoph is such a model of the ideal of Christian friendship. Two brothers. Two brothers. Now, um, of our five speakers, four I'm having the pleasure of meeting for the first time uh, this evening. But one of them is an old and very dear friend, and that is our, our Reno, Rusty Reno, who is the editor of First Things Magazine, our nation's premier journal of religion and uh, public life. Uh, Dr. Reno uh, formerly taught uh, theology at Creighton uh, University. He's the author of many books, including Fighting the Noonday Devil in the Ruins of the Church and Redemptive Change, Subtitled Atonement, and the cure of the soul. Dr. Reno. Thank you, Robbie, thank you. It is a, uh, it's a, it's a perilous thing to be the speaker after Dr. Perkins, a very powerful voice, uh, a very powerful, uh, a very powerful voice of God's word and, um, and, a, great, and a great speaker. I'm, I'm just a poor country editor, uh, as, um, as I would say. I did not have the pleasure of knowing uh, Pastor Arnold, and I know him only through his publications and, of course, through uh, the community that he pastored, which is a powerful witness um, uh, of, of his ministry. And so I want to make some just general reflections about what I've learned, both from his writings and from my engagement with the Bruderhof community. And Dr. Perkins brought my theme forward beautifully, um, and it's Jesus' words that I think come to my mind when I visit the Bruderhof community. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I come that they may have life and to have it more abundantly. So it's fullness of life that I see in the Bruderhof community. And it's fear that I would observe, it's fear that often is the great enemy of fullness of life. It's fear. Fear causes us to recoil, 
to turn in upon ourselves in a kind of self-protective crouch. And I think we suffer from many fears. We fear that our 401k account is not going to be adequate. Uh, or we fear that we're not good-looking enough or popular enough or successful enough. Um, or, at a more fundamental level, we also we fear death, we fear loneliness, we, feel a bit, we fear abandonment. And this is, often causes us to turn away from the fullness of life which is available to us. And so in the Bruderhof community, I've seen and what I've learned uh, also for the writings of Pastor uh, Arnold is that community, community, and uh, to be engaged and to see the face of the other, that community is a very powerful, powerful um, way to overcome many of our fears. It's a great testimony that the Bruderhof community doesn't uh, uh, doesn't uh, subsist on 401k accounts and such things, and uh, the kind of trust that one has to ha one develops in one's fellow um, Christians is a very powerful uh, guardian against fear. But there's a deeper fear, I think, and that, and it has to do with the fear of death that I think is actually more powerful than we recognize. Um, that death's claim to have the final word in all human affairs, uh, that it's the period at the end of the sentence, um, death, that this is a, a, uh, a great impediment to fullness of life. Um, that it, death holds the trump card to all of our plans and our hopes and our aspirations, that it's the end point of all of our relationships that can put a limit on love. So it's, I think it's important to recognize the way in which community is a living form, the body of Christ, that it's the resurrection of Christ that's the great deliverance from the fear of death that puts such a limit on our ability to have life and to have it more abundantly here and now, to say nothing of eternal life. That this is a very powerful message that, uh, that I think um, the Bruderhof community and Pastor Arnold um, committed to that message. And, and my way of thinking about it, that uh, this power of Christ's power over uh, death, his triumph over death, not just sin but also death, is, is a source of Christian freedom. I think it's somewhere in Pastor Arnold's writing where he quotes uh, uh, the famous uh, plea by uh, Arch Archimedes, uh, where he's, Archimedes asks, to, would someone give me a place to stand and I will never, uh, and, I, and I will move the earth. Give me a place to stand and I'll I can move the earth. And life in Christ gives us a place to stand. Community, the body of Christ, to participate together in Christ's presence in the world as uh, the community of believers, this gives us a place to stand. And I think anyone visiting the Bruderhof community senses the fact that the people in that community have a place to stand, not just a place physically, but also uh, a community that, that can stand with them a community of accountability, a community of encouragement, a community of teaching, a community of prayer, a community of mutual sacrifice. And also, the resurrection of Christ gives us a place to stand, uh, a place to stand. Um, sometimes the most important wor word of freedom is the ability to say no. Uh, sometimes that's the, that's the only freedom that we have is the ability to say no. That's the freedom of the martyrs, that they will that they will confess Christ uh, and say no to uh, the requirement to do otherwise. And this freedom, whether it's from community and the freedom that comes from our participation in Christ's resurrection, this this freedom is, as I've learned from reading Pastor Arnold and observing the community and the Bruderhof, 
that this freedom is central to peacemaking, to peace and to peacemaking, which I think is the great charism or great gift of the Bruderhof community is the gift of peace and peacemaking, um, that this freedom is really central to that ability. And it's really for the simple reason that freedom, that peace always comes at a cost. And you have to have the freedom to pay the costs of, of peace. So it's really my real pleasure, and I've always been deeply inspired by my visits to the Bruderhof community, so it's my pleasure to be able to honor the life of Pastor Arnold, pastoring this community that has helped me see the potential that I may have life and have it more abundantly. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. And uh, also let me take this opportunity to say thanks to Rusty and to Mark Bauerlein and to the First Things team for co-sponsoring uh, this afternoon's uh, event. Uh, before I introduce our uh, next speaker, I want to take a moment because um, Cardinal Dolan said that he hoped that Christoph's beloved wife, Verena, was here. She is in fact here. She's here and her children are here and some of her grandchildren are here. Let's show her our love. Verena. <laughs> we all miss him so much, you most of all, of course, and you were such an important and powerful figure in his life, inspiring him and assisting him in everything he did. So those of us whose lives were so deeply enriched by him owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude as well. Thank you, Verena. With God's help, yes, that's right, with God's help. Uh, Stacy Rhine. Our next speaker has worked as a family counselor at the YMCA in Roxbury, Massachusetts, as assistant director of youth and senior programs at the Jewish Community uh, Center in Syracuse, New York, director of the youth programs at the YWCA in Manchester, New Hampshire. She's been to all these states where she's made great contributions. And for the last 23 uh, years, she's been CEO of United Way of uh, Ulster County. In addition to that great work, she is the executive producer of Dancing with the Stars Ulster Style, a successful fundraising vehicle for United Way and their important work. And she created the Game of Real Life, an interactive simulation based loosely on the Milton Bradley Game of Life. And uh, I think the neatest thing about uh, Stacy that I've learned is that in 2001, she became a mother, adopting little Hannah Ruth Rhine from Cambodia. Stacy, I'd like to begin by giving you a bit of background information. The federal government has a program called the Emergency Food and Shelter Program, which I think it's important to note accounts for 0.00003 percent of the federal budget, which really is $120 million out of $4 trillion. It provides funding to local nonprofits throughout the country for emergency housing and food for those in need. A strange quirk in the program is the fact that none of the funds can be used for security deposits. Now, it may have been a while since you had to put down a security deposit in order to rent an apartment, but the fact is you cannot rent an apartment without one. So it has always rankled me that a federal program that purports to prevent homelessness does not support one of the critical requirements for doing so. In addition, the funding for this program has been significantly cut over the past decade. In Ulster County, where the Woodcrest and Maple Ridge Bruderhof communities make their home and where I have worked for the past two decades, Funding for this program has decreased by 93%, leaving us with only $7,000 for emergency food and shelter. This decrease was not based on need or effectiveness, but solely on a formula that deals in absolute numbers of low-income residents rather than rates. 
So our neighbor Dutchess County, for instance, which by all means is a wealthier one, receives 15 times the amount of funding for this program than Ulster County does, even though our rate of low-income residents is higher. It was this circumstance and the multitude of calls for help that we get that first prompted me to approach Johan Huliet, Outreach Director of the Woodcrest Bruderhof, to discuss how we might partner together to address this gap in services. There were a few things that were important to both of us. One was that any funding that the Bruderhof provided would need to be a last resort after all other federal, state, and county sources of assistance had either been accessed or denied to the party seeking help. We wanted to make sure that this was a true safety net, that it would be there for families and individuals who literally had no other option. The second aspect of the partnership that we both felt was important was that the funding be provided to those who would be financially stable after receiving this. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, only assisting those who have the capacity to assist themselves once the immediate crisis has been abated. But allocating $1,000 to a family to avoid homelessness in June, only to find them threatened with homelessness in July or August, just doesn't make financial or programmatic sense. And surprisingly, each part potential participant, or each potential applicant, excuse me, understands this. Those unable to meet this criteria are referred to the county's Department of Social Services to receive more long-term assistance. And so in 2012, the Bruderhof and the United Way of Ulster County began to embark on this journey together, a journey which has been tremendously successful. To date, we have prevented 422 families, including 1,266 individuals, 67% of them children, from becoming homeless. We've helped a nurse at a local hospital whose husband left her and her three children with no child support. We helped a single mom who was working three different jobs to make ends meet, but became ill and needed surgery, resulting in lost wages. We helped another family who had to provide caregiving to a terminally ill relative, again, resulting in lost wages. There are hundreds of stories like these, and what is most striking, and probably most surprising, I know it was to me, and I've been at this a while, is the fact that all of these families, the majority, 70% of them, have one thing in common. They are working. But the jobs they have are low wage, not paying enough to contend with life's curveballs, but too much to be eligible for government assistance. So where do they go? Who's going to help them? In our case, we have been blessed, and I mean truly blessed, to have the Bruderhof communities living among us, communities that Pastor Arnold watched over and led by example for decades. As he indicated in his book, Cries from the Heart, and I quote, Loving thoughts and words must be brought to fruition in concrete deeds. In the case of our small rural section of New York State, these concrete deeds have given hardworking, good people the dignity they deserve during trying times. And I was so pleased to hear that it is the intent of the Bruderhof to replicate this program in other communities where there is need. And the need is considerable. A recently re released report commissioned by the United Ways of New York State called the ALICE Report, standing for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed, indicates that 29% of households in New York State, 33% in Ulster County, are above the poverty level, which is $24,600 for a family of four, I consider that destitute, not poor, but are considered Alice households, living paycheck to paycheck. These families include the salesperson or cashier at the local Walmart, McDonald's, Starbucks, or just about any other retail establishment you or your family may frequent. They include janitors and office clerks, personal care aides who assist those with serious physical disabilities, the person who waits on you at your favorite local restaurant, customer service representatives, security guards, nursing assistants, those providing child care, and many more. And this is not endemic to Ulster County or New York State. 
To date, 14 other states have completed the ALICE report, and in every case, the statistics are similar. Why is this important? Because it sheds light on a heretofore invisible population of people in need. They don't look poor. They are working, and the understandable assumption is that they are self-sufficient. But the fact is, they are teetering on the brink of financial collapse. They are only one car repair, one medical bill, one family illness away from potential homelessness. And please believe me, I am not overstating the case. People contact my office in a panic. I don't know if you've ever heard what panic sounds like, but it is heartbreaking. Our partnership with the Bruderhof has enabled us to say, yes, we can help you. We can make you and your children stay in your home and not be evicted. You don't need to be afraid. Help really is on the way. To be able to say those words to a struggling family, terrified, they will find themselves literally on the curb simply because they had to take care of a sick child or an aging parent or because they needed to make a car repair in order to get to their job, to be able to say, yes, we can help you, is one of the many gifts our community has received from the Bruderhof and one of the most compelling legacies of Pastor Arnold's life here on Earth. Thank you. Christoph's uh, friend taught him and teaches us that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And the second, Jesus says, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. As Christoph never failed to remind us, the essence of Christianity, the core of it, the heart of it is love. Love not in some washed out, modern, sentimental sense of feeling or emotion, but love in the real, practical, meaningful sense of willing, actively willing the good of the other for the sake of the other. If there's not action, how can you say that there's love there? And that's what Christoph was all about. He was all about love. And because he was about love, he was about justice as Dr. Perkins reminded us. And because he was about love, he was about forgiveness and Jesus' wonderful message about forgiveness. And that's the message of our next speaker. Hashim Garrett is founder and CEO of a consulting company called Wisdom and Understanding LLC. I know a lot of businesses and universities that could use the help of a consulting company called Wisdom and Understanding LLC. And his message, delivered so passionately, educating on the causes of conflict and emphasizing the importance of forgiveness as part of the solution, is a message that comes from his own personal experience. In 1990, when he was only 15 years old, Hashim was shot six times was a gang-related shooting, and it left him paralyzed from the waist down and filled with resentment and anger and a desire for revenge. I doubt that any of the rest of us in the room have been shot even once, much less six times, but it's easy to imagine the feeling, the desire for revenge that someone would experience in that circumstance because we know that we have desired revenge for far less offenses. However, after a few months, Hashim realized that forgiving the perpetrator of that horrible crime against him was the only thing that had the power to free him and move him forward positively. And this man, still a young man, has not let his paralysis turn him into a victim or prevent him from leading an active life of remarkable achievement. He's a graduate of Rutgers University where he majored in investment banking. At the same time, he was violence prevention coordinator at the Kessler uh, Institute. He taught at the Harvard violence prevention, uh, uh, in the Harvard violence prevention uh, program. He founded his consulting company and also joined Breaking the Cycle as a speaker on behalf of the cause of nonviolence and the cause of forgiveness. And forgiveness is, is the, forgiveness is the cornerstone of his company and it's the cornerstone of his life 
and that's his message, and that's what binds him so closely to the legacy of Christoph Arnold. Hashim? I'll tell you, I, I received a, a text or an email um, from one of the brothers at the Bruderhof, I think it was Johan, and it was telling me about tonight's event. And uh, for the past few nights, I would wrestle with, what am I gonna say to talk about Christoph? And so here goes. Uh, I met Christoph Arnold about 10 years ago, and he really was a, a answer to my prayers. And why I say that is because I remember praying to God saying, you know, amongst my thousand prayers, saying I hope one day I get sponsored, that I could go into schools and talk to students and not have to, you know, ask the principals to find money in their budget so I could come in and do this work. And little did I know that one day I would meet Christoph and his organization would be my sponsors, allowing me to go into schools and talk to students and not worry and have that fear about how am I gonna get paid to do this work. So <clears throat> I get a phone call from Ian Winter, who is the director, the director of our Breaking the Cycle, him and his wife, Janet Winter, and they say, we'd like you to uh, come join Breaking the Cycle and speak to students about forgiveness. And I didn't talk to students about forgiveness. I talked to students about conflict resolution. And so I said, sure, I, I, I can do that. And I didn't know how difficult it was gonna be to actually talk about forgiveness. Because here it was, I was gonna go into high schools and middle schools and tell these students, yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, I was in a gang, and a kid shot me six times, and oh, by the way, I forgave the kid for shooting me and crippling me. And I knew that wasn't gonna really sit well with kids. <laughs> is they weren't gonna be able to comprehend this whole, he shot you, tried to kill you, he crippled you, and you forgave him. That part, I knew I was gonna lose him. But I said, I'll do it. And I went out into the schools here in New York City and parts of New York State and New Jersey with Christoph, and he was patient with me because the first 200 assemblies, I barely ever said the word forgiveness but he was patient with me. And I would watch him along with Stephen McDonald, I would watch them talk about forgiveness. And I would watch Christoph Arno in this tall six foot five, six foot six stature, talk to students about forgiveness in his thick German accent. And I said, you know what, one of these days in my mind, it struck me, I said, if he can do it, I can do it. If he can get up in front of these kids that don't look anything like him sometimes, where there's a 50-age gap, and he can talk about forgiveness, I'm going to do it. And I started to do it. And I began to tell kids, you know what, forget the conflict resolution part. I really want to talk to you about forgiveness. And it, my story morphed. And so... I had the pleasure of working with Christoph almost 10 years uh, and his wife, Verena Arnold, and the Breaking the Cycle team. And so for every year, we probably spoke to about 100 schools. So that's close to about 1,000 schools, if my math is correct, 1,000 assemblies. And Christoph couldn't make every single assembly. So let's just say I spoke with him at 500 assemblies right here, shoulder to shoulder. And the best part of the assemblies was the, the pre-show, the, 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 the time before the assemblies. That was the best part, because I would walk into the school, or if I had my wheelchair, I'd roll into the school, and Ian and Janet would always find a seat for me to sit right next to Christoph. So I'd sit in one seat, Christoph be in another seat, and if we had more time, Verena would be right there, all right? And I would talk with him, and we'd have these quiet little conversations. So we had 500 quiet little conversations. Yeah. Hey, Christoph, what you think of my, how's everything going? And just talk. And even though we spoke 500, on 500 occasions, he never said the same thing again. <laughs> It was always different. Every assembly was absolutely different. There were some awesome assemblies. There were some that weren't so awesome. We were in a school one day, 
And uh, Christoph, he, he used to tell a story about uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson and how Christoph heard Reverend Martin Luther King tell a crowd inside of a church how the shooter who killed Jimmy Lee Jackson is probably in this room and we, they had to forgive. And so one time we were at an assembly and uh, we were talking about Cassie Burnell and she was one of the students at the Columbine massacre and how she hid underneath a desk and the two kids, they came in to kill the students and they saw Cassie Burnell hiding underneath a desk and we're in Nyack school, in a middle school. And he asked the kids, uh, so the shooters, they go up to Cassie Burnell while she's hiding underneath the desk and they ask her, do you believe in God? And while the kids were pointing the gun at her head, she looks up and she says, yes, I believe in God. And those two students at Littleton, Colorado, at Columbine High School, they blew her brains out and they killed them. And Christoph, in one of the assemblies, he asked the students, how many of you would have the courage to say that you believe in God in a school? He says this, and it wasn't the first time. Well, this overly sensitive principals in a the school, they came and they grabbed the microphone away from him <laughs> and he laughed, but it was scary because here was a school that invited us into, mm -hmm. talked to their students, and he asked them a question, would you have the courage to say you believe in God? And they were so offended that they grabbed the mic and said, we don't want him to speak anymore. And I was the next speaker up, and I stood up to go speak, and literally the principal stood behind me to watch what are you gonna say. And I said my two Ps, my part, and we walked out of that school, but we were a little uneasy. We, we had a little tremble in us, because that had never happened before. They grabbed the mic and told us, get out the school. We don't ever want you back in our school again. But it didn't stop him from going out to another assembly. And I never knew what he was going to say. We went to school one time in Connecticut. We were to school in, uh, it was a high school. And uh, there were so many children in the school, in this high school. And a lot of the boys that came into the high school, they came into the auditorium. They were all holding hands, and they were hugging each other, and the kids were in relationships. The boys were going with the boys, and the girls were going in with the girls. And I said, okay, I know what Christoph is gonna tell them today, that the way that they're living is wrong, and I knew he was, I, I, I thought that I knew exactly what he was gonna say, but he totally confused me because he didn't say anything of what I thought he was gonna say. He told the students how much he loved them. I just, no, I said, Christoph is going to tell him that being gay is not right and this is wrong and Jesus doesn't want you to do that, but he didn't say anything like that. It was the total opposite. He just embraced them with love. And the students were so grateful. He didn't judge them. He, he would, sometimes he would go out on, a, out on a ledge and he would talk about God and schools, even if they were sensitive with it, he would still do it. And then it would be my turn to go up and talk. And then I would say, well, if my brother went out on the ledge to talk about, about God, he's not going to be out there by himself. So here it goes. Yeah, God is real. That's right. And I'm Muslim. And if, you don't, if he's going to go out on that ledge, I'm going to go out on that ledge with him. If you're going to kick him out, you're going to kick me out too. So we go to a school, excuse me, I got a lot of stories. I told you I was with them like 500 <laughs> times, right? So we go out to Biola University and Biola is a Christian college. And so we're having breakfast and we're all sitting at a table. And Christoph is a person who was bigger than life to everybody else, but to those like, Verena, he wasn't bigger than life, that was her husband. And to everybody else, he was bigger than life. But to Heinrich and Chris, that was their dad. And Wilma and Margaret, those were, that was their dad. He wasn't bigger than life, that was their dad. But to me, he wasn't bigger than life. He was my friend, really. I would look at him like, oh, you're my mentor. He would say, I'm your brother. You're like a father-like figure. You're my, I'm your brother. And so I learned, he's my brother. He's not my father, he's my brother. And that's my brother. And so we go out to Biola University, right? And so... He says, Hashem, you know, the, the school says at Biola, they never had a Muslim on campus before. So Hashem, this time, I don't want you to say that you're Muslim. I go, nope, I'm going to say I'm Muslim, Christoph, because you always tell me to say I'm Muslim. This time I'm saying, nope, nope, 
I disagree with you, I'm gonna say I'm Muslim. And he doesn't say anything. And I go out into the, do the assembly, and I tell the people that I'm Muslim. And on that day, if you watch a YouTube video of him speaking on Biola University, he talked about Malcolm X. It was like him having my back. He said, Hashem, if you're gonna go out on the ledge and tell him that you're Muslim, then you know what, today I'm gonna talk about how important Malcolm X's voice was in America. He had a funny way of supporting you, staying true to his message. Amazing man. Um, so Christoph meant a lot to me, he still does. As you can see, it's very difficult for me to get through the message. Uh, he christened my son Zen. He was <sighs> he meant a lot to my wife and I. I'm gonna miss him forever. And you know, I'm from Brooklyn. There wasn't anything I wouldn't do for this gentleman. We would go into schools and sometimes the kids, they didn't want to listen. They didn't care about the assembly and they were just happy because they had a free period and he would get up and he would start talking to the students and he could tell that he, he wasn't connecting with them. And as soon as I would get up into the school, you know, get up to talk to the kids, I would start yelling at them. And I was just like this close from wanting to punch a kid in the face because I loved them so much because they weren't listening to my big homie. And if you're not listening to him, I'm going to snatch you by your shoulder. I'm going to get your attention because you got there by the time I got finished, like, oh my God. And they would come up and they want to shake his hand like, oh, I didn't know, you know. I used to tell Ian before Christoph passed away, I was like, you know, these assemblies, we need to do something different. We need like a hype man for Christoph, you know? We don't need to just say, oh, here go the speakers and Christoph start. No, you need to have me come out like with, and say, listen, he Marshall Martin and he knew Mother Teresa and he knew the Pope. Now are you ready for Chris? Like we need to hype him up, man. Let him know who he is, you know? And um, I mean, I love the, the, this gentleman, man. You know, and he, and he spoke about faith and he spoke about family, but he did it in a non-judgmental space. You know, he, he was a man of few words, but if, his, if there were three words that he said often to me was Jesus, love, and courage. If there were three words that he said consistently, if I said God, he always said Jesus, no matter what it came back to, it was always about love, and then, well, Christoph, how do I do X, Y, and Z? Have courage. And it was just a cycle. It was Jesus, it was love, and courage. Jesus, love, courage. Oh, and by the way, faith, family. Jesus, love, courage. And he always asked about, how's your dear wife Mia doing? How is your wife Mia? So, that was my friend. Jesus love courage. Jesus love courage. You know, Hashem, they, uh, I, I don't know what it is about the word God that seems to paralyze some school officials and school administrators. Uh, I, back in the 90s, I had the pleasure of serving on the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and we were holding some hearings out in Los Angeles. And uh, we're in one of the inner city schools, the Watts area. And... Uh, you know, we had to go through metal detectors to get into the school and uh, all this stuff. And, you know, it was like a prison. It looked more like a prison than a school. And uh, talking to the principal, and the guy said, uh, I said, well, what's your worst problem? He said, well, frankly, our worst problem is theft. You know, if anybody puts anything down anywhere, for, turns his face away for a second, and another kid steals it. And uh, we tried everything. You know, we've had counselors, we've had assemblies, you know, we've had all this stuff and nothing seems to work, you know. And I said, have you tried putting up a sign that says, thou shalt not steal? Why don't we try? They said, oh, no, we can't do that. <laughs> no, 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 we can't do that because Ten Commandments are banned. Oh, boy. So, uh, remember that uh, anybody who has any questions... Uh, write them out on the card, and the usher is going to collect the cards uh, here just in a couple of minutes. But our next speaker is Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Regan, who's a 30-year veteran of the New York State uh, Police, and he's served 
uh, over those years in a variety of investigative patrol and special operations uh, assignments all over the state. Uh, he's been a member of the New York State Police Mobile Response Team as well as the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Regan served as the detail commander uh, for the New York State Police response to the Hurricane Katrina disaster uh, in uh, New Orleans back in 2005. He's held commands really at every level up to and including his current assignment, uh, which is being assistant deputy superintendent in charge of all uniformed operations. And he will tell us about a side of Pastor Arnold that until very recently I did not know. So thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. It just, it's an honor for me to just represent a little bit about how uh, Christoph's message of peace and reconciliation intertwined with law enforcement and how it began in, in Ulster County, really. Um, a little bit about the New York State Police. We're, we're a 5,000 person, a sworn person agency. We're amongst the ten, top 10 largest in the country. And we're divided geographically into troops and zones. So even though we're statewide, and a lot of you might think of us only as, as uh, issuing tickets on the highway, we're intertwined in the local communities that we serve. So that's how uh, we're, we're part of the equation uh, there. And I went to high school in Ulster County, and I knew a little bit of some people from the Bruderhof. I didn't know a lot about it. Um, I thought uh, maybe that they were an insular community, perhaps purposefully enigmatic. Um, I didn't know a lot about them. And, and I've had a very great fortune in my career in law enforcement to do everything you could imagine that, that people in law enforcement do. Uh, I've been very blessed and very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time for a lot of things. But my home has been in Ulster County, so through that work, I, I would get transferred different places and do different things, but I'd always come back to Ulster County, and I began to learn a lot about Christoph and what the Bruderhof did and, and how they're outreaching. And you hear a lot about it today, some of the things, but it really is amazing, this uh, selfless, um, not just giving, but um, uh, really... Uh, personal investment in people, in communities, and in doing what they believe is right. Uh, one of the unique things about law enforcement in upstate New York is that you have many communities that are served by a local police department, a county sheriff's department, and the state police, all doing the same thing in the same area. And 25 years ago or so, um, you might think it was good, but that's a, it was a very bad equation. There was a lot of parochialism, failure to ask for or offer assistance uh, or share information. And this was really at the expense of public safety. And it was really a, a tragic um, uh, occurrence. Uh, and, and in Ulster County, uh, there was a, a police chiefs association that began to form. And, and through these meetings uh, between police chiefs, it was inclusive rather than exclusive. The, the, they began to break down barriers uh, where the, the nameless uh, rejection of, of assistance or failure to ask for it now became more personal. And, and Ulster County was really a model in terms of, of interoperability between law enforcement agencies that I was able to draw from in, in a lot of my experiences. Um, but it wasn't until I came back to Ulster County in 2004 to take command of the state police in Ulster and Greene Counties, and that was about the same time that Kristoff and the Bruderhof's uh, involvement in the Ulster County Police Chiefs Association really began to expand. And it was really something amazing because there were positive relationships, but Kristoff's involvement really made them uh, stronger. Um, because his ability to reach people, speak to them on a personal level, those three words that he would say would resonate. There would be three different words for every person that he knew, but they were the right words that that person needed to hear. And he, he bolstered the relationships that we had, but what he also did was build relationships from w outside of the law enforcement community that didn't exist prior to his involvement uh, with clergy people, community groups, elected officials, and different people that really uh, law enforcement never really reached out to. And not only did Christoph uh, build these relationships, he also inspired further relationships. I can say personally, through the work that Christoph did, I was inspired to do more of that work on my own in terms of outreach and uh, um, you know, being part of communities. And Christoph really did this by earning the trust of the law enforcement community. And he built bridges uh, that really hadn't been there before and opened up lines of communication at these bridges that um, 
you would think his, his message of peace and reconciliation would be at, at odds with, with law enforcement, and it really wasn't. And because of the, the work that he did, and, and during the, uh, the current decade and certainly the previous decade, a lot of uh, distasteful things have emerged uh, in, in our society in terms of, of, as it relates to law enforcement, an atmosphere of distrust uh, between communities and law enforcement. And, and what Christoph did in the local community in Ulster County, there was many incidents that occurred, just like in, in communities across the country, uh, that uh, where, where they, whether they be uh, hate groups or um, unfortunate encounters between law enforcement and communities, that because of the, the bridges that Christoph either built or inspired, uh, there were dialogues uh, with community groups that prevented uh, unfortunate incidents or distasteful incidents or episodes from becoming disasters like they had in so many communities that you see uh, across the country. And I attribute that directly to the work that Christoph did. I also got an opportunity to see the impact of his counseling uh, on, on, for law enforcement families. And he would be there uh, from the simplest uh, types of things where, where people involved in law enforcement are traumatized or impacted by some of the, the things that they have to see or endure or be involved with, or families of law enforcement officers that had killed themselves or, or, uh, um, or who had been killed in the line of duty. And what really spoke to me uh, about Christoph's selfless uh, investment in these people was not so much that he would do this work of counseling and being there, uh, that was commendable in and of itself, but the bonds that he built. Uh, I, I know families that have been touched by, by Christoph and the Bruderhof who a decade later uh, are still deeply involved and have this resource. And it's so telling because in, in any crisis situation, uh, Oftentimes, counselors are, 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 it's like a circus. Uh, there's, there's an interaction and, and it's over. And, and because they can't get personally invested because they have to go on to their next case. And with Christoph, it was never over. He, he had friends and people that he touched uh, for, for life. Um, and that really uh, impacted me. And, and personally, I felt like Christoph, uh, to me, always offered sage advice. Um, he always made this personal connection that made you feel special, made you feel like you're his best friend. And then you find out that he's got 100 best friends. And you would think that would diminish your, um, you know, your feeling of being you know, made feel special by him, and, and quite the opposite. I admired how he could touch me personally and, and say the right things and, and, and see uh, what I needed to hear and, and listen and be patient but he could also do that to so many other people. And what struck me is that it was genuine with each and every one of them. He wasn't running for office. Uh, he, he, he wasn't trying to, to be something he wasn't. Uh, he didn't look for anything in return ever. He just made this connection. Uh, he was doing what he felt was right and it really had a tremendous impact on me. And one of the things that I don't know if I can and properly articulate why I think it's so important, and I was having a conversation with Ian earlier about Stephen McDonald, and I thought about his life, about how, how the power of his work, um, just the message that he sent out, it, it, it didn't matter when he passed away. He could have passed away 10 years ago. His message was so strong, or he could still be alive. It didn't matter because he, he laid the groundwork for a message and a body of work that's going to have an impact on people, that people further that work. And I really could say the same of Christoph. I think his, his legacy is evident in the people that are here, the people that talk about him, the people that are, are anxious to continue his work, not only with law enforcement, but, but in all of the things that the Bruderhof community does. And while he's sorely missed, um, He's still alive, and he's still with us, and, and so is his message. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful to be here, but I'm grateful to have been a small part of his life as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, representing the Bruderhof community uh, and the family is Pastor Arnold's son, Heinrich Arnold, who is a physician's assistant, a school teacher, uh, and a pastor. He lives in the Woodcrest uh, community, the Bruderhof community uh, in upstate uh, New York. Heinrich? Well, thank you. It's hard to know what to say. So the first thing I'm going to say is praise God and thank God. And I want to do what my father would have done, and that is turn this back to all of you. 
because that's what he was about. And we've heard it from all the different speakers, and I know we could have had many other speakers up here from all walks of life. And thank each one of you for coming out tonight, and also I want to thank those that are listening or watching. And particularly, I want to thank Brother Metin in Turkey. He's a Christian in Turkey who sent email correspondence almost every day in the last three or four years of encouragement. And he needs encouragement because it's difficult to be a Christian in Turkey right now. So praise God and thank you. Thank each one of the speakers for what you shared. There's a rich, a real, this is true diversity. This is, this is gathering. This is love. I want to thank mom. And yes, mom, I got it. Thank you, God. <laughs> she never wants to be mentioned. I want to thank each one of my sisters, six sisters, and one brother, Emmy Maria, and her husband Michael, who's here, my sister Margaret, who's in heaven, her husband Reuben, and new wife Sarah, Veranely, and her husband Ray, and Hannah, and her husband Chris, Anna Marie, and her husband Tim, who are in England right now, and my big brother Chris over there in the back, and Priscilla with her husband Red. Chris's wife is Estelle. Thank you for uh, standing by. And thank, you know what? I want to say one thing. We are all family. This is family. And there are people missing from this family. Dad would have wanted, he would have wanted to go to the Bowery Mission and pull a brother out from there. In fact, there are three brothers that came out of the Bowery Mission that became his brothers. And one of their sons is here today, Reuben Ayala. Welcome. So, what did we learn tonight? Well, like the Cardinal said, this is one of Dad's favorite sayings, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be. That's what we need to keep doing, is gathering in Jesus' name. And like Hashem pointed out, Dad would always say, in the name of Jesus. He would always mention Jesus, whether it was the right thing to say or not. And I also want to express appreciation to the Cardinal and to the uh, brothers and sisters in the clergy of the Catholic Church for standing shoulder to shoulder, like you mentioned, on many issues. Particularly last two or three years ago in Rome, we gathered for a colloquium to represent the family as God created it. And that was a real privilege for my father. He really appreciated that chance to stand with brothers and sisters from many different faiths and give this witness. Brother Robbie, thank you. And thank you for the first things for what you put together tonight and for your untiring support and being a real brother to dad in this message. And even though you are an esteemed professor of jurisprudence, you also can bring it down to simplicity like you appreciate dad doing it. And I appreciate your message and your word that you put out and also your message to the young people to really think about issues and stand up and think for themselves. I appreciate that. Brother John, John Perkins, not only were you a hero and a brother, you were like a father to my dad, which makes you my grandfather. And um, yes, really. And what you represented to dad was this, this real privilege of what he felt being part of the civil rights movement in his participation as a young man and having marched together and, and seen um, Martin Luther King. And his vision for the beloved community is what you pointed out tonight. And that is what we're going to continue together. So thank you. Thank you for making this long journey today. I know it's difficult for you. And uh, Brother Rusty, you said you were a, a, what, a humble uh, country editor. Well, you sure put out an eloquent magazine. So thank you. You represent the publishing world, which is another part of Dad's life that didn't come out too strong tonight. Um, but he really, he, his heart and soul was in spreading message through books, through writing. He loved writing. And his first work in the community was publishing. He restarted the Plow Publishing House. And I have to say, out back there, we have some, a book table from the Plow Publishing House with some great, um, great books there, not only from my dad, but from other authors as well. So thank you for what you do in the publishing world with your magazine and many other works. And Sister Stacy, I really appreciate you coming. And we think here, Stacy represents the hundreds of people that really give their whole life, their effort, their hearts into serving the poor and the underprivileged in Ulster County, 
And I know there's hundreds of thousands of people in every other county in this country that really are out there advocating for those that are unemployed, for the, the women and children that are victims of domestic abuse, for so many causes like that, homelessness. And it really means a lot that you came out tonight, and we want to continue working together with you and many other groups. Brother Hashem, that's my brother. That's my brother from another mother, but we're brothers. And there's a real example of teamwork, what you and Dad and Ian and first Stephen McDonald, the late Stephen McDonald, and uh, other brothers like Chief William, Anne Marie. The way they go into school and work together, it's kind of like a, an A-B, you know, like a good cop, bad cop routine. They really, they, they give it to the kids and the message gets out there. And I didn't go very often. When I did go, I would just sit back and enjoy watching that, the way the attention of these young teenagers who would come in very rowdy would, would suddenly realize there was a message here that was different, and they would start listening. And you show the strength of forgiveness, Hashem. You really do, brother. So keep it up. And brother, brother Pat Regan, thank you for your words. It means a lot the way you could summarize this interaction and this, really this bridge building that was a miracle. I find it a miracle that, it, that it, the way it grew in Ulster County with the law enforcement, with the local government, with the religious leaders, and, and there's no reason why this can't happen everywhere, and it should happen. And this is a great group to, to give this message to. We should make it happen. I want to give a shout out to my brothers from the law enforcement. In the back, they always in the back corner. Look in the back left corner, and you'll see them there. Sheriff of Ulster County, Sheriff Paul Van Blarkham, thank you for coming tonight. Colonel uh, Bob, thank you for coming. Um, and Under Sheriff Frank Falutico, thank you for the work you do. And let me tell you, contrary to what many people think, the majority of law enforcement really and truly are peacemakers. And let's work together. And they put their lives on the line. And let's support them. Let's pray for them. And Dad found many brothers and sisters in law enforcement community, in the, uh, in the prisons as, as prison guards. And it was wonderful to go into prisons to both minister to the prisoners and to find brothers and sisters in the uh, corrections. And it's like that wherever we go. If we look for the best in people, if we look for the God in people, we will find it. And let's build that. And let's do that through love. And let's do that through forgiveness. That, if, if I had to summarize what Dad represented to me, it was that. It was simply love, forgiveness, faith, and courage. And I want to end um, one thing that, uh, that Dad loved. He loved the passage from Joshua, where God is speaking to Joshua after Moses died. And he said, I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Be not frightened, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this is what Dad told us about these words a couple years ago as he felt he needed to say farewell to us. He said, now it is your turn to lead the people to the promised land. Often the promised land is not shown to us in our lifetime. It only comes at the very end when God comes to get you. How do we find the promised land today? God promised that we will find it, and it needs people who have the courage to lead, to have the courage to be hurt, who have the courage to try and fail and still try, who have the courage to forgive and who have the courage to love. So I can't add to that. I just want to leave you with blessings in the name of Jesus, of courage, peace, faith, hope, and love. So thank you. Thank you, Heinrich. Thank you, Kelly. Well, I have some uh, questions here to put to uh, the panel. Uh, Heinrich mentioned that uh, in addition to our audience here at the Union League Club in uh, New York, we've got people all over the country who are uh, watching the live stream. I have a friend out in Oregon who's uh, watching, and I know that there are uh, people far and wide who are listening in. It's great tribute that uh, 
that uh, there are so many people whose lives were touched by Christoph Arnold, uh, some of us who had the very great pleasure of knowing him personally, but many people through his books and through the testimony uh, that he gave. So, first question. What prompted Pastor Arnold and the Bruderhof to go out of their community? How did, their keep, how did they keep their identity intact despite extending themselves out into the world? That's an excellent question. Uh, Heinrich, do you want to offer a thought on that? That's a, a very good question. And I would say faithfulness to God, to Jesus. If that is our identity, we won't lose it. And if we are obedient to Jesus' commands, we will go out into the world. And we continue to want to be faithful to that great commandment, Jesus' last commandment to his disciples to go into all the world. What does that mean? So that's how I would answer that, and we keep our identity if we focus on Jesus. Yeah. I don't know if any of the other panelists would want to say a word about that from their experience. Yes, Dr. Perkins. Yeah. That's what we would talk about most when we were meeting. How can you hold fast to that? which is good, and continue to reach out, hold fast to a biblical foundation, and reach out. So I think that was an ongoing, and I think that's eternal vigilance. I think you're going to always have this, you know, because your people are being born anew all the time, and they're at that place of life. And I don't think that's a, a simple answer. I think that's... Uh, the answer you have to live out day by day. And probably forgiveness is that the key to all of that. Yes. Stacy? Yeah, I'd just like to add that um, in our community, um, which is about 200,000 people, um, there isn't one person, and, and this is just amazing, anywhere you go, you say the word Bruderhof, and every person I've ever met in the 23 years that I've worked knows what you're talking about. And the reason that they know is because they are so intimately involved in our community. Um, they are everywhere helping everyone. And frankly, our partnership, part of how it started was because everybody was calling the Bruderhof for help. They were getting hundreds of calls a week, a month, thousands. and. <laughs> They were not equipped to deal with all these calls because the word had gone out, call the Bruderhof. Um, and they, you know, they, they're on all the committees. They're, you know, whenever there's a, a problem or a tragedy strikes, they're, they're just always involved in their local community. So just from, from a grassroots perspective, that's how they've kept themselves um, known where, where we are. Very helpful perspective. Thank you. My, my own take uh, on this was reflected in my opening remarks uh, this evening. One of the things I've noticed about the great teachers of humanity, among whom I certainly count Christoph, is that they are not people who leave their traditions behind and then try to hover somewhere out there in the stratosphere. There are people who are deeply rooted in their particular traditions, but because of their greatness of soul and the power of their message, they're able to touch people Beyond uh, that, I, I, I mentioned uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in England, d devout Orthodox Jew, but yet a great uh, teacher of, of, of Christians, Jews, Muslims, people of no faith uh, in England and, and throughout the world. And if we look at history, we find this. Uh, I, I think it's often a mistake to suppose that, that the way to be universal is to cut yourself free of particular traditions. It actually, I think, works the other way. And Christoph is a very good example of this. He, he was the teacher of Catholics like me. He was the teacher of uh, Jewish people. He was the teacher of Muslims. He was the teacher of people who had no faith. And yet he, he was able to do that because of his deep rootedness in his particular uh, part of the Christian tradition. If I could just uh, add in here, and you mentioned this, this reference. <coughs> I think this, this question is best answered by the greatest commandment of Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, even your enemy. And this is the verse that mom picked to put on dad's gravestone. Yeah. The next question is what spiritual disciplines or practices allowed Pastor Arnold to be who he was? Now, this is something I think that 
even those of us who were his friends, with very few exceptions, probably only his closest friends and family members, would know how did he pray in his private life? What did he do to maintain his spiritual uh, uh, strength? Heinrich, I think you're going to have to speak for the family on this one. I'm uh, making communication with mom here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> he prayed. His prayer life was simple, but it was genuine. And he, he spoke often about prayer. And he said, prayer is for everyone. Prayer is silence. Prayer is gathering. Prayer is singing. Prayer is groaning to God. Prayer is tears. Prayer is laughter. So he prayed. And uh, sometimes we'd ask him to pray aloud, or he would in our communal gatherings. They were usually powerful, but they were not long and complicated prayers. And I know in his heart he was praying constantly. Were there uh, spiritual masters um, whom he apprenticed himself to? Uh, any of the great saints? Uh, were, there, were there practices derived from any of the various traditions of Christian spirituality that he claimed as his own? Yes, there, um, well, he had many spiritual heroes. Uh, there was a, a pastor, a Lutheran pastor in the 1800s, uh, Johann Christoph Blumhardt, who he actually was named after, who in his writings um, spoke a lot about the reality of faith, of the kingdom of God coming on this earth, and believed in, in real practical love. If you, would, if you would show love and you would speak faith, lives would change, and they did change, and miracles happened. And so that was a one of his spiritual mentors, but pretty much anyone that stood for God, whether it's St. Francis or any of the, the great uh, heroes of faith, Dad would find examples and, and inspiration from. Uh, Hashem, this next question is for you, and it's about interfaith conversations. Did you and Pastor Arnold have conversations about Christianity, Christianity and Islam, the relationships between the faiths, the history of conflict, the efforts to work on shared values and so forth? Um, one thing we, we typically did is when we would have conversations about uh, me being Muslim or him being Christian is that it was this common thread that love unites us all and that God is God over all of these different religions. Um, I never got the sense from talking with Christoph that he was trying to convert anyone to his particular religion, to the religion, religion of Christianity. Um, but it was always in a space of love. But he never skirted around saying Jesus, though. That was just something he, he just never kind of conformed to say, well, if you say Allah, then I'll say Allah as well. You know, you say Allah, that's good in your space. But I will always say Jesus. You know, and for me, having all of these conversations with him, it actually led me to ask spiritual advisors, well, who exactly is Jesus? It made me want to know more about who Jesus is, you know, and, and from those kind of conversations, you know, I, I told his, his son, um, Heinrich, I was saying, you know, early this year, uh, I was baptized. And now I'm, I'm no longer Muslim, but now, you know, I'm Christian. And I was baptized in the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, Church. Oh, yeah. You know? The ancient, uh, the ancient yeah. Orthodox Church, yes, yeah. of Ethiopia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but it was those kind of conversations about Christ and just saying, listen, no matter where you're at, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And so, but again, he just... He never forced his religion upon anyone. He never made me feel that my religion was wrong or the Catholics have the answer, but Jesus is the way. Yeah. Dr. Perkins, were you wanting to say something? No, I, yeah. Christianity and Christ and Jesus is how we live. It's a behavior. That is a powerful testimony <laughs> to me. Mm -hmm. That's worth coming to New York to hear <laughs> that where love and faithfulness 
overpowered and that he could say that he was uh, baptized. That's what I mean. The first behavior, <laughs> that's supposed to be one, the first expression, being baptized, that you have found Jesus. I mean, this is, this is powerful. Cardinal Dolan, in his, uh, in his opening remarks, spoke of that. He, he recalled from the Acts of the Apostles uh, people looking at the, the pagan people looking at the early Christian community and saying, see how they love each other. And it was that example of love as much as it was the actual um, catechizing or evangelizing of, mm -hmm. of people with words uh, that made such a difference. I think it's Pope Francis, or one of the recent popes who uh, was fond of, uh, fond of saying, always preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Mm -hmm. That it's our actions that, uh, that, that, that preach the gospel. Exactly. That might be what he meant when he said, let our light, our behavior, so shine before the world that they would see our good works. That yeah. could be, you're not saved by the good work, but they would see the good work and give glory in the to God. lives of others. Yeah. Uh, Hashim, did you I, want to I say? Just, yeah. I wanted to say something to kind of piggyback off what you just said is that Christoph and even Christoph and the entire Brudelhoff community, I've never looked at them as Christians, but more like Christ-like, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so that is to kind of echo what the points that you're making. It wasn't about preaching, it was just about living the word. I think there's a famous line, it's attributed to Gandhi, I'm not sure if he said it, uh, uh, but uh, the line is, has Gandhi saying, I like your Christ, I don't like so much your Christians. Mm -hmm. And what an indictment mm -hmm. yeah. of, of us who are Christians mm -hmm. when we fail to live up to Christ, whom we're supposed to be following and uh, whose love we're supposed to be uh, radiating. Mm -hmm. But certainly no one could say that about, uh, about, about Christoph, right. uh, who, uh, who simply radiated in his very being uh, the love of Jesus. One more question, and it's a very good one. How should those of us gathered here, and, and you folks live streaming, you're in this too, how should all of us who are participating this afternoon carry Pastor Arnold's legacy forward, you're going to like this, Dr. Perkins, in practical ways? How do we carry the message? How do we carry the work, the legacy of Christoph Arnold forward in practical ways? You get the first shot at that, Dr. Perkins. Then I'm going to just ask everybody to weigh in. Well, I, I'm thinking about my own life. I think keep on persevering. Mm -hmm. Keep on persevering, keeping on growing in grace. Uh, I, I, that would be my recommendation. Keep on keeping on, right? Keep, keep on keep, keeping yeah. on. Yeah. And because Christoph didn't have the privilege of knowing what we know now about his Muslim friend who is now a believer. Mm -hmm. R Rusty, did you want to? Well, I think uh, just to follow on what Dr. Perkins was saying, uh, mm -hmm. persevere and persevere and make sure you always say Jesus. Right. <laughs> okay. that's, that's, there's power in the name. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Jesus love courage. Mm -hmm. Jesus love courage, like Hashem said. Stacy, did you want to say a word about this? You're, just, you're doing very practical things. I just <laughs> wanted to repeat um, the quote from, from the book, um, Cries from the Heart, was continue to put loving thoughts and words into concrete deeds. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that's what does it. We just have to do that, I think, very consciously, you know, really make a conscious effort every day to... Because most people are loving and thoughtful. It's just making, the, you know, taking the next step, you know, and transferring, whether it's smiling at somebody on the street, a stranger that you don't know, and, hey, how are you? You know, just spreading, spreading goodwill and doing good deeds. Hashim? Um, first, I would say is I would continue on working on being a better husband, because he was married for 50 years, so I want to I wanna reach that mark. Uh, during one of our 500 conversations out of the blue, he said, Hashem, 
You know, the Bible says be fruitful and multiply. So I want to keep doing that. I want to keep <laughs> multiplying. Amen, bro. You know? Amen. Um, and I'm just going to keep on forgiving. I'm just going to keep on forgiving and sharing that message with students to keep doing that. Yeah. Pat? I think that, um, you know, from a, from a, a law enforcement perspective, uh, carrying on the work that, that or the example that Christoph said, living that example, a lot of times we are uh, law enforcement and insular community. We, we, you know, we hang around with each other and, and, and kind of think that nobody thinks like us. And, and what he taught me was to immerse myself in other communities with other people, to know other people, not just on, on the surface, but get to know other people and where they come from and, and what they're like. And I think I also carry that message personally uh, into immersing myself in, in groups of people, types of people that, that um, it might be uncomfortable to get to know and to be part of their community. And I, I've been able to do that uh, in large part because of the example that he set, and I look forward to continuing, continuing to do that as well. Heinrich? I'm loving all the practical advice I'm hearing off to my left here, with maybe the exception of my wife, Wilma, might not be happy with Hashem's uh, advice. We have seven children and are blessed <laughs> by God. <laughs> <laughs> But then again, Abraham had, was a man of vision. Um, but I'll answer it like this. I'll answer it like this. On Thursday, Thursday before Holy Saturday, two days before Dad died, my brother Chris and I had a very precious private moment with Dad. And we asked him pretty much that same question. Dad, what do we do? How do we keep going? And he looked at me, he looked at Chris, and he said, you know, Stay true. Yeah.